Aloha kako. My name is Brianna Govea, Program Specialist at the King Kamehameha V Judiciary History Center. On behalf of the Hawaii State Judiciary, mahalo for joining our live program. I hope everyone is safe and taking care. Before we begin, I want to thank Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald and the Hawaii State Legislature for their work throughout the pandemic and for their support of our mission. Today, Kelly Nakamura and Brandon Mark Higa will share their knowledge about the experiences of Okinawan residents and prisoners of war in Hawaii during World War II. Brandon is a licensed attorney with a JD from the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where he is also currently pursuing his doctorate in law. Kelly is an assistant professor at Kapiolani Community College, where she teaches history and ethnic studies. And earlier today, Kelly was awarded the Peggy Renner Award for Teaching and Curricular Innovation from the Western Association of Women Historians for her Introduction to Ethnic Studies course. Congratulations, Kelly. Tonight's presentation is adapted from our guest speaker's recently published article in UCLA's Amerasia Journal titled, Yuimaru, Okinawan Prisoners of War Shape Okinawan Identity and Transnational Connections. I want to remind our live audience that you can send in questions through the webinar's Q&A box at any time during the program, and I'll field as many as time allowed to Kelly and Brandon after their presentation. The program is being recorded, so if anyone was unable to attend or would like to share the video afterwards, you can do so by visiting our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash JHC Hawaii. And now I'd like to turn it over to Kelly. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Kelly Nakamura, and this is our presentation on shaping Okinawan identity. Uh, shaping Okinawan identity and in Hawaii during World War II. So here we're going to start with this wonderful Okinawan folk song from World War II that captures the Okinawan prisoners of war, or POWs, ambivalence as well as hope as they arrived in the Hawaiian Islands where they were embraced by early Okinawan immigrants. Encounters between Okinawan POWs and local Okinawans are illuminated in articles written in both the English and Japanese language newspapers, military reports, and oral accounts by both Okinawan residents in Hawaii and Okinawan POWs. These historical records reveal the transnational connections that existed between Okinawan immigrants and Okinawan POWs as minorities in both Hawaii and in Japan by offering food, cigarettes, companionship, and friendship to these POWs, Hawaii Okinawans were able to reaffirm their connection to Okinawa and their own identity through actions that reflected the value of yuimaru, or mutual assistance and cooperation. Now, Okinawans did not forget about the generosity of Hawaii residents to Okinawan POWs and their support of relief efforts, especially after the Battle of Okinawa, commemorating these efforts in numerous celebrations. Even today, Okinawan identity in Hawaii and in Okinawa are shaped by mutual aid and connections forged during the war. The value of Yuimaru has transcended Okinawa and continues to inform the relationship of Okinawa and diaspora communities in Hawaii. So here's our overview of our presentation right now. So we're gonna be looking at Okinawan people pre-immigration status in Japan during the Meiji era, or the Meiji Jidai, Okinawan immigration to Hawaii and the pre-war experience, as well as the theme of war memories and Okinawan identities. Okay. Now, the initial group of nearly 40 Okinawan immigrants arrived in the islands at approximately 1903 nearly four decades after the arrival of the first Japanese immigrants. Now, although more than 10,000 Okinawans immigrated to Hawaii by 1911, they remain a quote unquote, minority within a minority, stemming in part from Okinawa's history as a once independent sovereign nation called the Ryukyu Islands. Now the Ryukyu Islands were officially annexed as a prefecture of Japan during the Meiji Restoration in 1879. 
subjecting the indigenous people to linguistic and cultural assimilation policies. Now at this point, I wanna turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Brandon, who will further elaborate on these kinds of ideas. Go ahead, Brandon. unified in 1429 and recognized as the Luchu, an independent nation renowned as an epicenter for trade. The Ryukyu Kingdom participated in the Chinese tributary system and was viewed as an independent country by China. Uh, Okinawa maintained its independence until late 1800s during the Meiji Restoration Era. So the Japanese people were profoundly impacted by the Meiji Restoration Era, which ushered in a period of societal, legal, political, and economic transformations. This period refers to Emperor Meiji's enthronement in 1868 through his death in 1912. The Meiji period was marked by Japan's expansion through colonial territories and its discovery by foreign explorers. Japan faced an external threat when it was invaded by Commodore Perry's fleet of black ships. Perry invaded Naha port in Okinawa by way of Edo Bay in 1853. So the Meiji government first considered the Ryukyu Islands as an unassimilated territory. However, these lines of sovereignty between Japan and Okinawa became blurred following Commodore Perry's invasion. Okinawa was placed under the administrative control of Japanese bureaucrats sent to tra transition the former territory to life as new Japanese citizens. Under Japan's administrative control, the Okinawan people's lives were affected by public policies called assimilation policies, doka seisaku. So these assimilation policies were often associated with Japanese government's national policies during Meiji. These were aimed at making the lifestyles and ideologies of colonial peoples the same as the rest of mainland Japan. Japan's enactment of cultural and linguistic assimilation policies in Okinawa were part of a larger campaign of unique homogeneity for the new territories. The Meiji government publicly announced the Ryukyu Disposition of 1872. This national policy unilaterally abolished the Ryukyu Kingdom. The Okinawan king, Shotai, was forcibly exiled to Tokyo in May of 1879, thus leaving the law and society of the Okinawan people solely in the hands of the Japanese bureaucrats with administrative authority. Okinawa was annexed as a prefecture by the Meiji government in 1879, Subsequently, the Okinawan people were integrated as a former colony into the Japanese nation state. However, the Okinawan people were classified as Shin Nihonjin, as a group with different and lesser rights than the mainland Japanese people. Under the Meiji constitution, the Japanese people were considered subjects of the emperor with limited rights and duties flowing from the emperor himself. Japanese people did not gain individual rights as people until the enactment of the post-war constitution of 1947. So although Okinawan people were ultimately subjects of the emperor after Okinawa's annexation, they were covered under a separate classification through these assimilation policies. These assimilation strategies were aimed at unifying the emperor's new subjects in the colonies under a central Japanese rule. So to this end, Japan imposed a ban on indigenous customs such as tattooing traditions, consulting shamans, and replacing the Shinto um, religion with the Okinawan indigenous one. Language standardization, Gengo Doitsu, was implemented to require all of the emperor's subjects to speak standard Japanese. The Okinawans were forbidden from speaking their own language, which was back then mistakenly classified as a dialect, whereas it's a vastly different language with different roots and different structure than standard Japanese. Japanese teachers were sent from the mainland to Okinawa to implement language standardization curriculum. And Okinawan children were publicly shamed by their peers in classrooms for speaking Uchinago and exhibiting any indigenous practices. Interestingly, Kumiodori, which is Okinawan dance dramas, very similar to Kabuki, were banned for containing materials dangerous to the national polity and for being injurious to public morals. So the discussion of Okinawan people's legal status as Shin Nihonjin 
during the Meiji Restoration era provides insight on people's rights under the Meiji Constitution of 1889 and how these public policies further impacted Okinawan people differently than Japanese people. These points reinforce Kelly's classification of these Okinawan immigrants to Hawaii as a minority within a minority, even before they came to our shores. So in short, these public policies impacting Okinawan communities locally and in Japan during the period covered in our research were primarily driven by national governments. This brings us to Okinawan people's immigration to Hawaii during the Meiji period. At this point, I'll turn it over to Kelly to take us through those uh, immigration stories. No problem. Okay, well, thank you very much, Brandon. Thank you. Now, looking at the impact of World War II, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, many in the Okinawan community in Hawaii were just as surprised as their Japanese counterparts, and they were concerned that they would be associated as enemies of the United States. The Office of Strategic Services estimated that officials incarcerated approximately 200 Okinawans during the war, and they did not distinguish, interestingly enough, Okinawans from Japanese prisoners and restricted their movements both within and outside the camps. Yet despite these perceived dangers of the so-called residents of Hawaii, Okinawans and other POWs seem to have greater freedoms and liberties than incarcerated longtime residents or even American citizens, even if they resided in the same facilities. Perhaps this disparate treatment might be due to the fact that the POWs often arrived in the islands years later after the incarceration of local residents, some of whom had filed legal challenges to their incarceration. Now, military officials were also conscious of adhering to the terms of the Geneva Convention that seemed to provide greater protections and freedoms to former military combatants compared to incarcerated aliens and American citizens. Now, according to the Provost Marshal's section, authorities detained approximately 17,124 POWs and inmates in the Hawaiian Islands from December 7, 1941 to September 2, 1945, with a maximum confined at any one time being approximately 11,351 individuals. Now, during the war, officials brought in approximately 5,000 Italians, 4,766 Japanese, and 3,723 Okinawans to alleviate the acute wartime shortage in the islands. Okay. So let's see. Let go here. Okay, so again, here is Okinawan immigration to Hawaii. And you can see its proximity to one another. And we're going to be looking at, of course, their, their experiences being brought to Hawaii. Now, authorities first detained the POWs at the immigration station and at Sand Island Detention Camp in accordance with military instructions to quote unquote, utilize available facilities whenever possible with further instructions to surround enclosures with quote, two fences of chain link or barbed wire construction at least eight feet in height and at least 12 feet apart. So what you see here is that here are some photographs of some Japanese immigrants, excuse me, inmates, that you could probably see would be very typical of the experiences of Okinawan POWs. Now, authorities would later move the POWs, and here, of course, is a Sand Island uh, internment or incarceration center. Um, after, of course, Sand Island incarceration center or internment center, here to Hono Uli Uli. This was also referred to as the alien internment camp, or POW compound number six, in part due to the fear of a direct attack and invasion. The camp itself was surrounded by a double fence with watchtowers equipped with machine guns and floodlights with separate accommodations for officer POWs who authority held in buildings designated specifically for generals and field officers. Okay, so again, what you see here is a Japanese POW being interviewed um, by a local um, Japanese, we, we assume, uh, interrogator at uh, Hono Uli Uli. And you can see they are going to be very clearly identified by the clothing um, that they're going to be wearing here. Now, at the height of the operation, there were over 400 of these tents. And you can see some of these facilities of these generals, including, of course, single pyramidal and double tents at the camp. And you can kind of see 
um, in the background some of these tents. Now camp officials would disinfect newly arrived POWs, gave them standard clothing and supplies, and most lived in small six to eight, in, uh, eight man tents, used pit latrines, and took cold water showers. And in here, see a closer look, some of these uh, tents that house anywhere from about six to eight men. Um, you can see again the barbed wire surrounding these facilities and the watchtowers uh, with, of course, lights and guns pointed in. Okay. And here's the processing station that they were disinfected and given standard clothing. Now, in accordance with the Geneva Convention, POWs were not allowed to do any military related work, and officers were exempt from mandatory work detail. Enlisted men were also required to do some basic work within the camps and they could volunteer for other work assignments, including assignments outside the camp where they could work upwards of 12 hours a day. You can see some of these photographs taken by local residents of some of these POWs in Hawaii neighborhoods on these work details. Okay? Now, thus authorities allowed POWs to work outside of camp, mainly for work on various projects, while local inmates in Honolulu Uli remained incarcerated. Over time, in fact, military surveillance decreased with fewer guards assigned to the prisoners. And in fact, even after the war, POWs were on an honor system at Schofield Barracks, housed behind barbed wire but without guards. So again, you can see some of these POWs, um, they had free reign in these Hawaii neighborhoods, which is very interesting. And you can see again, some of these POWs on work detail. Now, H.K. Howell, the commanding officer of the POW base camp, noted that one of the biggest problems confronting officials in charge of the nearly 10,000 enemy prisoners in Hawaii are locals fraternizing with the Okinawan POWs who comprise nearly one fourth of the total number of prisoners in the islands. And again, these photographs were taken by local residents. And you'd see this gentleman here, you see POWs being stenciled on his clothing and his pants to clearly identify him, but they clearly did not stop local residents from engaging, fraternizing, conversing with these individuals. And in fact, according to officials, every time Okinawans were sent to work on local projects, such as the rehabilitation of Punho School or Thomas Square, quote unquote, carloads of local Okinawans and their children about cigarettes, candy, fruit, money, anything else that they fight, felt might be acceptable to the prisoners, along with local residents who generously gave food and gifts to these POWs. Including, of course, uh, this gift here. Uh, you can see a local drawing done by a POW given to one of these Hawaii residents. Now, while fraternization between POWs and residents occurred in other camps, located throughout America, Okinawan POWs, the majority of whom were civilians, inevitably encountered familiar faces in the islands due to the relative proximity of Okinawa to Hawaii, as well as the existence of the large Okinawan population there. Okinawan families also seem to have heard of potential family members and acquaintances who could be found among the Okinawan POW population. Families on Oahu, also sought information about other relatives and friends who they had lost contact with during the war. Now, as a result of radio and newspaper censorship that existed under martial law, many local Okinawans were also eager to learn about the conditions in Okinawa and if family members had in fact survived the Battle of Okinawa. Other Okinawans offered food, cigarettes, and friendship to these men simply because of their connection as Okinawans. Many Okinawan immigrants had brought with them specific values such as yuimaru that encouraged mutual aid and support among Okinawans. Yuimaru, the community spirit of working together, was an important value that Okinawan immigrants brought from Hawaii, from Okinawa to Hawaii, and it possibly influenced their efforts to reach out and to support the imprisoned countrymen. Now, although authorities eventually returned these Okinawan POWs to Okinawa, the impact of their experiences created an enduring impression. Since 1981, a number of former Okinawan POWs have traveled to Hawaii 
seeking the burial location of the 12 missing POWs who died in the islands during their captivity. So again, you can see uh, this is a ceremony honoring the memories of these 12 individuals. Now, while the remains still are unaccounted for, on June 4th, 2017, a 72-member delegation from Okinawa arrived in Hawaii to honor their memory. The delegation included two former POWs, along with families of other deceased Okinawan POWs, Okinawan Vice Governor Isho Urasaki, members of the Okinawan Hawaii Kyokai, and journalists represented all of Okinawa's print and broadcast media. Accompanying the group was Choichi Hirukina, a living national treasurer of Japan in Ryukyuan classical sanjin to perform the memorial song, Janabushi, at a memorial service held at the Jikoen Honganji Temple. Now he played the song on a sanjin that Okinawan Ise Kamisuke Kakazu had brought to Hawaii as an immigrant in the early 1900s, and he later passed on to his POW cousin Seisho Kakazu after seeing the POWs plucking out Okinawan tunes on a kankara sanjin, fashioned out of a discarded metal can, scrap lumber, and wire. Now, when authorities released Seisho Kakazu, he took this sanjin back to Okinawa with him. More than 70 years later, after Kakazu had passed away, his younger brother Susumu decided to return the sanjin to Hawaii and join the local Okinawan delegation. And here, of course, is the family celebrating uh, the memorial service. But for local Okinawans, the generosity and support they expressed for Okinawan POWs that embody the spirit of Yui Maru is also a reflection of the aloha spirit that they have come to embody as assimilated residents of Hawaii that has been intrinsically linked to their connections to both Hawaii and Okinawa and the similarities of the values of aloha and Yui Maru. Okinawan identity in Hawaii, in particular, has evolved, and later generations of Okinawans, as well as, of course, the decline of prejudice towards Okinawans. Events such as the memorialization of 12 missing POWs and the pilgrimages of their families and fellow POWs that was celebrated by Okinawans in Hawaii and in Okinawa reveal how important these transnational connections are still today to both groups. The honoring of the memory of these missing POWs and their experience in the islands represented a mutual celebration of the values of Yui Maru that unites these disparate communities over the 100 years since the immigration of the first Okinawans to Hawaii. The embrace of an Okinawan identity that extends beyond Okinawa reflects a global understanding of unity as well as cooperation. Now, before, of course, we formally conclude, I want to, of course, give the opportunity for Brandon to further elaborate on our conclusions and findings. So, Brandon, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kelly. We appreciate that. Um, so, through our research, we really um, were able to discover the depth to which Okinawan prisoners of war contributed to a richer understanding of the Honouli Uli internment camps. It also gave us um, context for understanding the Okinawan people's legal statuses prior to immigrating to Hawaii. And also um, this provides background for uh, contemporary looks at the Okinawan people's minority status as a minority people, um, as well as a discussion of their immigration to Hawaii and other places. Okay. And Thank you very much. And of course, if you have any questions, you. Uh, you can email Brandon or myself, and we can be found here on our way.edu addresses. So thank you very much for this opportunity. All right, we have a lot of great questions here. Um, we can start with the first one. Among the Okinawan prisoners of war, was there a range of loyalties to the Japanese war effort? In other words, were there some who were very loyal to the Japanese military and critical of fellow Okinawans who weren't? Okay. Um, so I think I'm gonna be answering that question here. 
Um, it seems that uh, as far as the POWs, because most of them were civilians, um, there were reactions range from apathy to maybe sometimes indifference or sometimes just unknowing what was going on. Um, they were swept up into the war, forcibly conscripted by uh, the Japanese military. Um, many of them uh, did not express overt connections to uh, Japan itself. Um, they were not part of these highly nationalistic groups that um, in my further research um, during the World War II period that we see in the Japanese community here. So we don't see that highly, very specific um, nationalist experience or understanding or sentiment that actually existed um, among some of the uh, Japanese POWs as well as some of the nationalistic groups that actually existed here in Hawaii during World War II in part just because of their status, primarily as civilians. Some of them, in fact, in my research, range as young as age of 14 to 16 years of age. So honestly, these were children. That actually ties in really well um, with the next question. So what were the ages of Okinawan prisoners of war? Prisoner of war and then were there women? And of course, you just said there were children prisoners as well. Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, in my research thus far, I have yet to find any women who are POWs. Um, again, uh, we do hear about uh, young children, uh, young girls um, being conscripted as far as in Okinawa to provide medical support services. We don't see as far as the POWs. Um, the soldiers, uh, they were primarily uh, young men. Um, again, we see as young as 14 years, 16 years of age. And again, these are from accounts from local Okinawans who actually encountered some of these individuals. And they remembered, you know, speaking to uh, young boys. And, you know, they were very empathetic and sympathetic to the experiences um, of these young men who were swept up into this war, um, you know, as unwilling, honestly, combatants um, in this global conflict. So you mentioned many of them were civilians, um, and how many would you estimate were actually part of Japanese forces? Well, it really kind of ranges and varies. So, you know, in my other research, and I'm looking at, you know, the Battle of Okinawa, um, scholars still today debate um, really honestly how many of these were actual military combatants, how many were just simply literally grabbed out of school, put with the most basic military training, if at all, into these military units where they were literally slaughtered on the battlefield. Um, so how you would characterize them as actual military combatants, that would be in fact questionable when many of these school children were actually literally taken from their school to essentially the battlefields. Mm. So I would say, you know, we don't, I personally don't see the majority of these POWs being formally trained, um, you know, volunteers into the Japanese army. Um. Let's see, this next one, were Okinawan prisoner of war, war, excuse me, prisoners of war as a group treated better or indifferently by the U.S. military compared Seems to like, yes, other um, Japanese prisoners of war? The other interesting story that actually comes out here is the experience of the Italians. And the Italians themselves were also uh, given a great deal of freedom and opportunities. So we do know that some Italians were noted sculptors. So we actually, you know, hear stories about, you know, buildings and sculptures around town being constructed or, you know, carved by these Italian POWs. Um, it seems that just the experience of these Okinawans are just very unique in kind of the community response. You don't see that response from uh, the Japanese community as far as uh, trying to reach out to these POWs beyond the experiences of nationalistic groups here in Hawaii. You know, looking at these Japanese soldiers as, you know, combatants and, you know, fighting on behalf of the emperor. It didn't seem that, you know, these Okinawan communities here in Hawaii really had that kind of understanding. It was more these personal, familial, uh, prefectural ties and friendships um, that really drove this kind of behavior. I don't have any evidence quite yet of this kind of nationalistic sentiment. So it's so interesting to me, these kinds of personal relationships that still exist uh, between families and communities, both in Okinawa, as well as here in Hawaii. Mm. Um, let's see, we have so many wonderful ones. I'm trying to 
relate them to what you're going off right now. Um, so some, some of these are asking about um, migration of Japanese. So at the end of the war, were some of the prisoners of war offered the opportunity to remain in Hawaii or other parts of the US if they had family or friends who could sponsor them? And if yes, how many decided to stay versus going back to Japan? So that's a great question. Um, in my other research, I was trying to find out what happened to some of these POWs, um, what were the experiences. Um, I was looking at some of these Korean uh, POWs that were also swept up into this war. And I was looking at the National Archives for some of these oral accounts and what happened. And when I asked for the archivist, he's saying, you know, can I have, um, we do know these are certain individuals, can I have their personnel files? And they said, well, honestly, once the war ended, we sent them back. It was part of uh, the Geneva Convention. It was part of essentially uh, the post-war settlements where it was required uh, to return them back. So, you know, I poured through the National Archives and I asked for very specific personnel files of these individuals um, that we know were POWs and they just don't exist simply because, well, they were just given back and these records were, if they did exist, were destroyed. So unfortunately, we don't have the opportunities to see, you know, this kind of sponsoring. Um, although we do know that family members are reconnected here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, how did the Japanese government affect the Okinawa migration to Hawaii during the 1900s? Brandon, do you want to answer that or? Sure. Uh, thank you for that question. So the Meiji government may have authorized the migration of certain people from different prefectures. So. Um, when Okinawa was a newer prefecture, uh, that's when um, people may have started to come over. And as Kelly had mentioned in the article, uh, Okinawans immigrated four decades after the first Japanese came over. So, um, Kelly, do you remember which prefectures were among the first? To immigrate? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we do know uh, this is where you, you know, you talk uh, with uh, most local Japanese here. You'll see essentially these southern farming communities, um, you know, Hiroshima, uh, Fukushima, among others. Um, again, these were um, in part because of uh, the necessity of what was happening in Japan at this time. With the creation of a fixed land tax system, uh, we see an effort to create a modern government based upon a predictable tax revenue stream um, and so we're going to have this unique kind of tax system, which is a very modern tax system develop, but one which impoverish, in particular, the farming communities in the South. So that's where you see a lot of, um, you know, immigrants from Wakayama, um, among others, um, in the Southern uh, farming areas, really being, quote unquote, encouraged uh, to immigrate in part because they couldn't pay their taxes. So they sought better opportunities, uh, primarily in agricultural fields, not just in Hawaii and in America, but also um, in Brazil. We do see the largest uh, Japanese population of immigrants outside of Japan, and yeah. so today, um, based upon essentially their farming experience. Thanks, Kel. Um, let's see. Um, someone has asked if you could speak a little bit more about the differences between um, Japanese prisoners of war versus the Okinawan prisoner of war. Um, was it true that they were housed separately? So weirdly enough, um, you do see these, um, these POWs um, housed separately. Um, so you do see uh, them referring to certain uh, compounds and areas by certain names. Uh, that was, you know, the Italian side, that was the German side. Uh, this was, you know, the Okinawan POWs. And, you know, they were sent on very specific work groups. So it was kind of interesting to kind of see this kind of artificial demarcation, um, even if uh, they were considered, in a sense, combatants of Japan. Um, but again, it was this weird kind of distinction that was made. And for me, it was more unusual that you would allow Okinawan POWs on work detail when local Japanese, um, you know, first generation, second generation were housed in the same camps and were incarcerated for the duration of the war. So that kind of disparate treatment was actually more interesting to me to say, 
you know, American citizens and essentially immigrants that had come before them were actually treated with greater suspicion and regulations than these newly arrived POWs who were so-called former combatants, even if they themselves really didn't fight. Um, can you clarify why a local Okinawan would be incarcerated at Honouli Uli? Um, and they asked, did they understand, understand correctly that the prisoner of war work details would be given gifts by local Okinawans in Hawaii who were not incarcerated? So the question, the first part of the question was in regards to did the military officials distinguish between Okinawans and Japanese? Um, can you clarify the reasons why a local Okinawan would be incarcerated? So I guess a, yeah, an Okinawan resident, would they yep. be incarcerated? Mm -hmm. So again, this is where military policy is never really consistent despite what the military thinks. Um, you know, officials did not recognize a clear distinction between Okinawan residents and Japanese residents here in Hawaii. And as such, um, you know, it was only by happenstance that I found that, you know, one statistic where they actually segregated that there were approximately, again, we're, they're making their, their best guesstimation, as I like to say, um, about 200 Okinawans. So, you know, they themselves in most of the military records did not distinguish between Japanese and Okinawans or even Koreans at this time, um, who was some, were sometimes lumped in um, as part of, you know, the, a local um, a population. Um, so it was kind of this interesting, weird understanding. And to go to your second part of the question, um, it didn't seem that um, local residents understood that the gifts that they were given to local POWs would then be given to the Okinawan um, inmates in there. Um, it was more as a gift um, to them as POWs, and just as in part, um, relatives themselves or acquaintances or someone who had come from the same prefecture, that was enough to kind of spur um, sympathy and I think um, an effort to provide kind of this mutual support. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that some um, Okinawan prisoners of war died in Hawaii while incarcerated and they're burial place is unknown. Um, yes. Why is that? That is the million dollar question. And this is what people have been searching for since 1981. Um, we've looked at graveyards, we looked at grave sites, we looked at obituaries. Um, no one actually knows. We've gone through military records, NARA. Um, you know, I mean, that's the million dollar question. Where are these local uh, POWs, these missing POWs are buried? no one knows and it's just simply a mystery to everyone and you know the best scholarly minds in Okinawa and I think here in Hawaii have been dedicating a great deal of research um, trying to look at cemetery rosters and you know grave sites um, so it's been ongoing and I encourage anyone who has the willingness the desire to please look uh, for that because that is the missing piece that these families are honestly still searching for. And with the advanced age of many of these POWs and their families, um, it's honestly at this point a race against time. Um, where did you find, um, oh, shucks, I just lost the question. Um, where did you find all the photos of the prisoners of war working in the community? So all of this got started um, because I'm one of those weird people that still subscribe to the Honolulu, uh, you know, star advertiser. Mm -hmm. And I saw this front page uh, article about this and um, at this time um, they were announcing that the memorial service came. I contacted the Hawaii United Okinawan Association um, and the people there were just absolutely wonderful. Uh, they were just so generous in putting me in contact uh, with these families and individuals. I also work with an absolutely fantastic wonderful individual here at Kapiolani Community College. Her name is Sherry Tamashiro who's been just just incredibly supportive. She was in fact the one to invite me uh, to this banquet where, and this um, memorial service. So I got to experience and be part of uh, this remarkable story. So I really do appreciate uh, the personal connections that do exist. You just gotta kind of ask around and be upfront, I think about your research and what you're gonna do and try to present, I think a very honest and respectful story. Mm -hmm, 
Um, do you have any personal stories from your grandparents who might have experienced um, the shaping of Okinawan identity at this time? Um, not myself. Um, Brandon, do you have any insights on your family? I'm sorry, could you say that one more time, Kelly? Um, Brianna was asking if oh. we have any insights. Um, to give some kind of insight about my background, um, we had interesting family members who were part of the 100th and 442. Um, that was on my paternal uh, grandmother's side. And on the same time, we also had individuals conscripted and fighting on, in the Japanese army in Japan, actually in Southeast Asia. So none of them became POWs, but we have this very interesting um, division in our family history about World War II experiences. And my family, myself, we come from Hiroshima, so we also have um, stories about the experiences of the atomic bomb. Wow. Um, Brandon, can you share your kind of experiences in your family, if you have any? Yes, thank you. It's um, So I'm, I'm like a lot of Okinawan Americans here in Hawaii, where um, we have parents and grandparents who grew up during the, the World War times and are very quiet about that. So I was just spending the afternoon with my dad going to um, family graves uh, over at Punch Bowl. And um, coincidentally, we did end up talking about people's experiences around this time. And it got me thinking about the research and the presentation today. Um, so I believe the question was, if either of us have experienced, our, if, if our family had experienced firsthand yes. um, shaping Okinawan identity in World War II, yes. um, it, was, it, it wasn't one of those things that I had a family member that you know, really changed the tide and you know, wrote something or did something that is going to be recorded in history. But um, if you talk to people in the family, they'll know, especially my um, older relatives will know that um, my dad's siblings would go to Hono Uli and the other camps to um, bring these gifts that you had mentioned in the research uh, to people that were interned. None of my family members were in the camps, but um, to my surprise, a number of my uh, aunts and uncles did regularly visit the camps and uh, knew people personally that were there. So, thank you. Um, Brandon, are there any other questions you wanted to address specifically? I know we have a few more um, lined up. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks to everybody for participating. Uh, we've had a lot of excellent questions and answers that have been uh, Q&As that have been submitted. Uh, somebody had asked earlier, um, maybe this is something that Kelly can answer, if there's a camp that was in Kilauea? Mm -hmm. So there was a POW camp um, in Kilauea. Um, honestly, that is the other gap in the research. Um, more research needs to be done on what was going on as far as the POW camp, uh, the second largest camp um, in Hawaii, and to really kind of document their experiences. Right now, um, and again, this characterizes a lot of the incarceration story, it's a urban Honolulu-based story. But really still today, we've been discovering or rediscovering uh, the neighbor island story. And to really kind of understand what was going on in Kilauea, um, the community dynamics, what was going on, um, would be very interesting to kind of examine and analyze. Some of my accounts that um, I pulled as far as these connections were from the neighbor islands, from essentially um, young men being sent out on work detail and somehow uh, local Okinawan residents on the big island knew that they'd be coming along a certain road. So these women would wait on the side of the road and, and wave and, and stop the caravan um, and approach these young men and approach these young boys and offer a sympathetic ear, asking what's going on. And a lot of these POWs fondly reminisce about being able uh, to speak in their native dialect, to be offered local food, uh, to see, um, in a sense, familiar faces. But that definitely is something that we need to explore. Um, understanding the POW experience in Kilo Kilauea KMC. Thank you, Kelly. Sheldon asked if there were specific locations in the Sand Island area that were part of the camps. For the Okinawan POWs? Yes. Yeah. 
Um, so we do know that there were specific areas for the POWs and from what we can kind of tell um, from these accounts themselves that the Okinawans themselves were segregated. So that is where you hear stories about them playing the sanshin together, um, reminiscing, um, talking about their hometowns. So it does seem that they were also segregated in places like uh, Sand Island, um, even as they were transported uh, to from different areas throughout the war. Yes. There's also interest in self-guided tours of Hono Uli Uli. Are you aware of um, whether people can go around on the campsite? So there are self-guided, well, not self-guided tours. There are guided tours um, mm -hmm. by the Japanese Culture Center of Hawaii. Of course, that has been put on hold as with everything else. Um, but it's still something that it's not what a lot of people think is an easily navigatable tour. Um, it was called Hell's Valley for a reason. It's you know a very steep valley, inhospitable terrain. Would you see these photographs? Do not exist anymore. Um, it's a lot of underbrush, uh, kiawi trees, um, steep cliffs. West Oahu University of Hawaii, West Oahu is doing some archaeological digs there. So there's those efforts, but really it's not something um, that is what we think of like a national park in a sense of um, Yosemite National Park, easy accessible, um, available for people to drive up. Uh, it was donated by Monsanto. Uh, so you do have to go through part of their property. Um, but that is something that I encourage everyone to really experience and to really go down and do these tours with the Japanese Culture Center and see why they called it Hill Valley and why you know, the humidity just settled and they were pestered incessantly um, by these large mosquitoes and during the summertime, it was simply unbearable. So that's where you see these men, you know, stripped down, honestly, to their, you know, undershirts and looks like boxers, honestly, because they were just so hot at this time. Thank you, Cal. We have a question from Sherry Tamashiro. Could you share oh. the story of Shinyegima while in Okinawa with the military intelligence service discovered that his younger brother was taken to Hawaii as a POW? Did you come across his story? In your research? Yes, that's a great question. So Shinyegima is, he, and he has lots of these wonderful oral accounts, so we're so grateful for that. Um, so while he and other Okinawans were part of the military intelligence service serving as translators in the Pacific War, and of course um, in Okinawa, during the Battle of Okinawa, trying to convince Okinawan civilians to um, get out of these caves before, of course, um, the American military actually bombed them shut because they posed a military threat. Um, he heard that, you know, a younger relative was in fact in Honouli Uli. And if you guys want access to the article, I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, and there's you know, these stories about uh, Dami members meeting uh, this younger brother, this younger cousin um, in places like Kapiolani Park and providing candy and cigarettes and food and bento. Um, so I think Sherry's questions really kind of highlight this unique experience that some families had, where you had, you know, members incarcerated as POWs, suspected aliens, spies, whatever have you, and other family members um, in the same generation fighting on behalf, trying to prove the loyalty of the local Okinawan population. So I think, you know, that story really highlights this kind of divergent experience that unfortunately characterized experiences of many Hawaii residents here. Thank you, Kelly. We have a question from Pete Doctor I'd like to read. Um, and this will touch upon um, the view of Okinawan people as a minority within a minority. It's gonna to relate to uh, the labor aspects of their immigration. So Pete asks us that, um, He's seen reports by the, Jap the Japan Consul complaining about Okinawan laborers in particular as the poorest example of Nihonjin in regards to many Uchinanchu labor organizing, sometimes even organizing strikes when finding labor contracts had been changed before landing shore. So did this history towards labor organizing earn Shimanchu a bad reputation by industrial agribusiness, thus having them being targeted differently? That's a great question. So if you, we've done research and essentially highlighted the fact that Okinawans were also identified sometimes by these plantation owners as uh, 
Pete mentioned, um, as you know, rabble rousers strike uh, people who would encourage strikes. And they were given, in fact, um, some of them, um, a bad reputation as far as undesirables on the plantation. And so some people have speculated that uh, because of their quote unquote intractability um, on the plantations, this is why um, many Okinawans would then try to engage in other businesses um, like hog raising or hog farming. Um, later, of course, the restaurant industry. Um, you know, Okinawans sought opportunities and the great part, you know, I'm looking at Okinawan restaurants, the Oroku, um, you see these kinds of connections as they try to move off the plantations and hire each other, train each other to provide other economic opportunities beyond the plantations. But Pete is right. Um, looking at the article, you can see some of the sources that identify um, and where they are. Um, Okinawans is so-called undesirables because of their intractability on the plantations and their willingness and ability to organize strikes. Thank you, Pete. And thank you, Kelly. Thank you. I have a question about um, Okinawan immigrants that spent time in mainland camps from Shotanaka. So have you come across any information about Okinawans that were held in the camps in the mainland? For the most part, those stories seem to be obscured by the larger Japanese American narratives and Sho is interested in his family's experiences. That is also um, a great aspect to actually research. You know, how would be, how would the difference on the mainland incarceration camps be different from the POW experiences here? Um, as I highlight, you know, in our article, we look at this interesting dilemma that we do see fraternization occurring. So, you know, I did research um, some POW uh, camps in the South and you do see about this issue of local fraternization, um, but not to the extent that exists here. So really to kind of probe the very unique experiences of what these individuals experience in mainland America, that is definitely something that can be examined at this time. And to really see what would be the, you know, outcome of these experiences. Were they just something that, you know, they remembered or dismissed later in their life? Would you see these still kind of remembrances and commemoration ceremonies occur in places, for example, in the American South um, that occur here right now? We do know that there's pilgrimages um, to mainland incarceration centers from the families of these former incarcerated residents. Mm -hmm. In my research, I haven't seen these kinds of pilgrimages by former Okinawans, POWs, and their families to these mainland incarceration centers. So that would be an excellent topic to actually do further research on. Thank you, Kel. Yeah. Um, our, we have a question from James Shimabukuro. Are there any former Okinawan POWs that are still living and have you had the chance to interview any of them? So um, yes, uh, there are a number that are still living. Um, and if you contact me, we can uh, actually give you, we have a list and I can see the brochure. Uh, so most of them, again, um, they vary as far as their willingness and ability to um, share their stories, to be perfectly honest, they're in their 80s and 90s. Um, but if you contact me, I'd be happy to share um, the names and location of these individuals. Um, some of these oral accounts have been documented by Okinawan scholars. Um, and I can kind of also show you those sources also, uh, because this is also um, a topic of interest to Okinawan scholars even still today. Thank you, Kelly. In your research, have you come across any stories about why Italians were living in Hawaii at the time that Okinawans had immigrated? Uh, Italian residents here in Hawaii? Yes. Or Italian POWs? Italian, it's just Italian residents. Okay. Um, I haven't come across um, essentially if there were Italian, the immigration of Italian residents regarding essentially uh, why there would be Italian POWs, that was my main question. Why would there be Italians here, literally across the world? Well, according, you know, looking at my research, there was a number of critical battles in Northern Africa, where of course Mussolini had been trying to gain a foothold in Ethiopia um, to remove the Italians as far as way from the European theater, Hawaii was selected. So, you know, I had that same question, why would there be Italians here and why would it occur um, at this particular time 
Well, it occurred after critical battles in Northern Africa, after the defeat of Mussolini's forces. Um, they wanted to essentially remove the Italians as far away as possible. And Hawaii was honestly the best location for that. Thank you. Um, in your research, did you come across anything that um, answered the question of what happened to Japanese students that were in Hawaii at that time? Japanese students, um, I'm, I'm kind of confused. It could be a different way. Um, so Japanese here, I'm confused, sorry. Uh, I'm thinking of my first connotation would be like the Japanese students right now, Japanese studying in America uh, from Japan. Um, I haven't uncovered research for that. Um, Eichiro Azuma has done extensive research on the experience of um, Nisei who have gone to uh, Japan and studied as students, but none, we don't see too much research done on potential students from Japan here in Hawaii studying. So that is something that could be a gap in the research. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Okay. Um, what types of food were grown by Okinawan farmers? What types of food? Oh, that's interesting. Um, so looking at, um, honestly, you know, I'm looking at the history of food in general. Um, it really varied, honestly, by area availability. Um, you know, I'm studying the history of food and how it was transformed. Uh, traditional uh, Japanese or Okinawan cuisine, the ingredients simply could not be found in some certain instances. So cuisine was adapted. Um, you know, you do hear that it was primarily a rice, uh, sometimes fish-based diet, just by the availability of the resources. Um, local greens that could be grown, again, would be a little bit different. Uh, daikon, um, radishes, um, again, the pickling style would be a little bit different. But just, it really depended upon the availability of the resources and, of course, um, the region of the island that you were at. Um, it really would shape what was available at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, thank Brandon. You. Thank you so much for sharing your research. Um, we've had over 100 people participate, um, 100 live and a few dozen on, on YouTube and our Facebook watching us. So thank you so much. I know I've thank really you. appreciated this. this. has been extremely enlightening. Um, for myself. So, um, and I want to say thank you for the audience for your participation. We've had so many questions. Thank you, Brandon, for helping me field them. Um, we've, they've just been coming in. Um, and so I think just to follow up with this, um, I will be sending out an email to our RSVP list um, with the link to the YouTube recording of this for everyone to watch and share. And in that, maybe I'll include Kelly and Brandon's emails. Um, for any other questions we weren't able to um, get to in this time. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Well, with that, um, I want to say mahalo, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening, um, and take care. Thank you again, Kelly and Brandon. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Brianna. Thanks for Aloha. spending your afternoon with us. Yeah. All right. Aloha.